Welcome to Jamie Horton and King Lear, the role of a lifetime. It was about a year ago that Jamie and I were having lunch and we were talking about the projects we both might be working on. For me, I was thinking of starting a podcast. For Jamie, it was the role of King Lear, a role that had been roaming in his consciousness for some time, a role that caused him to pause and really consider the enormous undertaking and the resources that he would have to commit. But he also talked about the real desire he had to take on such a daunting challenge, a role of a lifetime. The more we talked, the more I knew that I wanted to somehow be a part of this journey that Jamie was about to embark on and to see if he wouldn't share some of it with the rest of us. So Jamie and I have met periodically over the last year to talk about his journey to Lear. Here then is that journey. Spout till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks. So let's begin with why Lear and why now? Yeah, it's something that I've focused on particularly in the last five years, I think is sort of fitting. I mean, I just had my 65th birthday. And, and as I said before, this is one of those roles that most actors, uh, well, a lot of actors will start to look at, you know, one of the, one of the ones that you want to tackle toward the end of your, or the middle to end of your career. Well, I think every actor of a certain age who enjoys uh, the world of Shakespeare at some point starts to think about the prospect of uh, performing this role. It's one of those pieces that is on a lot of actors' lists. That included me, you know, having heard about it from a couple of wonderful mentors who have played it, Tony Church of the RSC. Tony had performed it three times and spoke about it. You know, everybody calls it the Everest of Shakespeare. Not so much because of its enormous length, because it's actually not one of the longer roles of Shakespeare, but it is an emotional Everest. Understanding that is uh, the product of a life spent in the theater. As I think I told you, my friend Tony and others who have played it said, you might as well give this play your first crack because you'll never understand it the first time around anyway. And then the second time you come to it, you will understand a great deal more. And then the third time you might really grasp it. So given the fact that I'm 64 years of age, I figured now would be a good time to start. That is sort of background of it. I did a reading at Northern Stage in one of their New Works Now festivals a couple of years ago where I played someone who is standing by for Lear, and it was called Stand By Lear. That's when Northern Stage, the folks over there, began to become interested in yours truly doing this role at some point in the future. And we went on in our discussions, and this year uh, turned out to be the time they wanted to do it. So a confluence of factors that has led to this uh, exciting and daunting prospect. What is some of the history and influences that comes with this role? Yeah, one of the great challenges of the part is, um, is trying to figure out Lear's arc, where he starts and how he comes to the understanding of love and care in his life, that the arc itself is difficult enough to understand. Then there's the technical challenge of it, which is uh, there is a great deal of very impassioned scenes in this. And so how do you moderate or modulate the emotional arc of the character so that you're not just standing up there uh, 
declaiming mm -hmm. that there are many, many different levels to, to Lear and to try to figure out the different mountains and hills you want to explore, but they can't have a flat line. It's got to have just this enormous texture of different tones so that you don't tire of it. So that's, that's an enormous technical challenge that all of the actors that I've read about have, have talked about. You start hot and you get hotter. And, and the first scene is a bugger to play. The first scene is when he invites his three daughters to, to talk about how much they love him and how much they deserve their third of the kingdom. And then Cordelia doesn't go along for this and says, my love is what I declare. Uh, no more, no less. It flips this king out. The play starts at an emotionally very high level. And one of the questions that has been raised, why? What, what is it that uh, brings Lear to such a point of anger that he can't really hear what she is saying? People have postulated that uh, in Simon Russell Beale's performance of this uh, remarkable actor, that he explored the whole world of Louis body dementia and what that means. And that is part of, he hears a very capable king who has done great things in his time as king. You don't get to see all those. What you get to see is one of the first moments of, of dementia-like behavior. These flashes of anger are somehow connected to an old man who is beginning to sense that the synapses of his brain aren't working the way they should anymore. And he is angered by that to such a degree that his, his daughter says he goes after Cordelia in, in a, just a heartbreaking way in this, in this first scene. And that is something that happens just moment in a momentary flash of anger and then so and he spends a good deal of the play angry and so that is not a sustainable line you can't you can't do that you have to figure out the hills and the valleys of this performance and one of the things that we're going to be exploring in this production is when um, he is speaking almost to himself and to bring that down into a much more personal dialogue. I, I don't want to go mad. Fool, I shall go mad. And those, th those concerns that he has uh, about his own mental abilities right now and that he can feel the synapses splintering in a variety of directions and he ain't got no control over what he's going to forget next, what he's going to remember next, who he's going to attack next. And that's all a very, very rich ground to explore as an actor. That's part of the complexity of this journey that is really exciting uh, and really daunting uh, as, as an actor to explore. But I'm very, very excited about it. Because it's such a great challenge and you know the great actors that you admire so much that, that have tried this. It feels like a mountain you really do want to climb. So Everest is daunting. Yes, it's, the air is really thin and it is, it is a challenge. And so if, you're, if you believe that you are up to the challenge, and I at least believe I'm up to the challenge, whether or not I make the peak or not is yet to be determined. But So it is daunting, but not in a negative sense. It is just you better wake up, recognize the difficulty of the climb, and embrace it, train for it, prepare for it. And then there is that added element of not, uh, uh, that's unpredictable of whether or not the weather cooperates to continue this analogy and uh, whether you get there. That is what's fascinating about it. And I think I've only felt that a num number of times in my career where the projects uh, seem daunting in that way, that you have a certain respect for the challenge that you're about to face. And then familiarized through my research with a lot of other performances, the 
uh, and that's fascinating to see and, and understand what different actors wanted to bring out and how they went about it and the choices that they made. That is, that is populates this research and is written about at length um, about certain choices that they made, fascinating some of them, all of which we will consider and then the director will, with yours truly's input obviously as the person who's playing it, will start, will pick and choose and invent and create our own uh, understanding of what this journey really is about. But, so yes, I have been exposed to a lot of wonderful writing about choices that other actors and other productions have made. Let's talk a bit about the preparation that goes into this role. I think I would point to my own development as an actor, the opportunity that came up with an artistic organization that I have a great deal of faith in and a director that I have a great deal of faith in. And these elements come t came together to, to present the opportunity that I believed in enough that I couldn't miss it. And so made this year-long year commitment uh, of my time and effort and research and reading and line learning and that started earlier this year and will go until the limited rehearsal period that we have. We have three weeks. I, I laugh when I say that because that is like a drop in the bucket in terms of the actual rehearsal time with the company once we get there. But before that, I'm hoping that I will have spent a vast number of hours uh, working on this. Just committing, I think he speaks roughly a fourth of the play's lines. I've started the process. It's been a very exciting first few months. I've had an opportunity to work with my dear friend and colleague, Gary Logan, who works at Carnegie Mellon now, who's one of the best Shakespearean dramaturgs in, the, in this country. And we've gone through the text line by line, and I've understood through the different versions of this play and the different editors, what makes the most sense to me about every single line and every single I am in the, the iambic pentameter and how that might contribute to to a better understanding of what each line means. This next week, I hope to start work with a uh, voice coach to work on my vocal stamina and placement so I have access to the broadest range of expression that I can as an actor because vocally, it's enormously challenging. I will have uh, that uh, experience and that, that sort of retooling or retraining or whatever you want to call it with an expert uh, voice coach. Um, that I'm really looking forward to. And then there will be just hours spent working uh, in a variety of ways with the text and recordings and so on and so forth as I as I learn the role and hopefully get the role deep enough in my bones by the time I begin rehearsal that all of the actual language, actors talk about language being their breath and without your breath you can't live. And so if I can, if I can have this text, text deep enough in my bones by the time I begin rehearsals, that part of the challenge will be effortless. It is what you do with that breath now that becomes your field of study. Yeah, I think it will be fascinating for me because I've actually never, I mean, I've, I've known six months or a year in advance some of the projects that I'll be working on, but I've never prepared this way before. The, when I played George Orwell, um, it involved a lot of uh, prep prior to the beginning of rehearsal. I came into that one with Lines Learned also because it was an enormous text. I spoke a great deal of it. This is a longer and more complex journey. It'll be very interesting to hear, uh, in retrospect, what we've, uh, what we've recorded together to track that journey. And when I start rehearsals, and I, that will all go into a completely different universe. It will go into a universe where I've got input flying in from everywhere, directors, other actors, designers, that will in inform this uh, in a way that um, I haven't as yet been able to, to connect with. All too often, the actual mental challenge of learning one's lines becomes, because of schedules in this business being so tight, that a great deal of your work happens in a very short rehearsal space.
part of your task is simply the technical demands of learning a text and getting into your brain. I'm hopeful that I'm going to have that securely in place by the time I begin this, uh, this exploration with other people in the room. And then reflect, if you will, on the language of Shakespeare. Uh, you know, it's a, it sort of is a, is a little bit uh, a process also of osmosis. And it just, it, with this degree of familiarity that I'm hoping to have with the text, certain questions are coming into focus because of the language. One of the folks compares learning language to standing under a waterfall. And I, 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 learning Shakespeare's words because they are so extraordinarily beautiful. For me, they're a giant puzzle. And you, you figure out one piece at a time as this water tumbles over you. It's a remarkable experience because the language is exquisite. I mean, it's really, it's really extraordinary. I mean, people regard some, a lot of people regard this as the his finest tragedy. Some people call it one of the finest plays ever written. Blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow. You cataracts and hurricanoes spout till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks. You sulfurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white beard, and thou all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's molds. All Germana spill at once that make ingrateful man. All of that is this enormous process of discovery and blowing the language apart and then getting it back to its basics and understanding really how, how much of a genius Shakespeare really is, how much of it is described and comes through an analysis of the language itself and how much you can mine from the text itself. How is Lear relevant for today, and how do you place him into the present? There is no doubt that there is a part of King Lear that is a narcissistic personality. He's very used to seeing himself at the head and at the center of everything. And the way he treats people is in incredibly uh, self-centered. Whether that's a function of his uh, previous decades as ruler or whether that's a function of his uh, dementia, if that's the way we go, or, um, or some combination of those two things, I don't know yet. But there, he, he is clearly a man who is used to getting his own way, calling all the shots, and very used to people scurrying about him, keeping up with what he wants. I find that quite fascinating, the journey that King Lear takes during the course of this thing to realize, as he does, and I think we're going to be exploring this in this production, the poverty in which most of his kingdom lives is another resonant theme for me, and he, uh, how he comes to recognize how these folks live under his rule. And then at the center of the play is this understanding of what actual love might look like and that he learns how to care for and recognize the love of his daughter and others in the course of this story. And that journey of recognizing what that means, I think, is also very resonant. It, because I really feel as though this play has something to say right now. And I'm, I'm very interested. I'm always fired up by things that speak to issues that I am fired up about. It, it, it increases the connection between the actor and his or her material. And whether or not this play speaks to all of that, um, it speaks to enough of it and asks questions about similar things I feel like I, am, I can connect the play 
using the fuel that the current situation provides me. What Lear goes through in the course of this play is just really amazing. He starts out and he starts out and ends in a very, very different place. And uh, this is a, a really interesting thing for us to decide, but th this is a, a man who's used to complete uh, power, who gives it all away and learns a great deal in that process. But he starts out as uh, somebody who's, uh, the world revolves around his being. Uh, his country revolves around who he is. He, he, he is in many ways a narcissistic personality and he believes right that the world revolves around what he does and what he says. And when that starts to go awry, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a shocker. You know, he, he learns such an enormous amount about uh, love and about his subjects during the course of this thing. Unfortunately, it happens, and that's one of the tragedies, one of the things that makes this a tragedy, is those lessons are learned way too late. He learns about his subjects and this wonderful prayer that he gives to the elements when he's out on the heath. He really begins to understand that he's taken too, as he say, himself says, he's taken too little care of this. Well, let's see. It's October the 14th now. I am roughly two and a half months away from first rehearsal. I have learned about two-thirds of the text now, I would say, roughly speaking. I'm learning the fourth and fifth acts now. And uh, it's beginning to sink in into some deeper place. So I'm hoping that by the end of this month, I will have all but one or two scenes memorized, purposefully holding off on until I have a chance to speak with the director about. But everything else should be in the brain. And then I'll have two months to let that sift and, and work through. I've had an opportunity to work with Amy Levitt. She has been helping me with the language and, and my voice. That's been a great journey. All of the, the work that I've done to date, working with the dramaturg, working with Amy, and letting this sift through my own brain and my own notes and reading process, I, I feel pretty immersed in it right now. What I'm trying to do is to learn the text without a whole um, lot of assumptions about how things are going to be played and what the moments are like because we have yet to begin the rehearsal process. So I'm trying to learn the lines and analyze and understand and appreciate the text without jumping to too many conclusions yet. So learning by rote in, so, in some sense uh, without a whole lot of uh, preconceived thoughts about what it is. But I have to be honest that since I'm spending so much time with this that I would be a liar to say that some of these things are not sifting into the way I think about Lear and, and where he's coming from and where he's going. And I will, I will generate a whole lot of ideas about where I think Lear is and when. And then I'm going to be speaking, going to take a special trip down to New York in November to speak at, at length with the director about his thoughts. And we've been exchanging emails about the arc of the character and what the different pieces of that arc might mean and, uh, and using that as fodder for our conversations. Uh, yes, I am beginning to develop a sense of where Lear lives at, at various stages of this play. As to the voice, you know, that's that um, we've explored, Amy and I have explored a bunch of different options about where this character's voice may live, and I have yet to really experiment too much with that. But she has challenged me in a, in a, in a wonderful way about not assuming that Lear is one thing or another, but trying to allow me and put me in a neutral place where in the re during the rehearsal process, I can jump off and be in any of those places I need to be and allow my voice to, to reflect that. I think it's incumbent upon you as an actor to come up with the backstory um, and incumbent upon the director to flesh out that backstory so that all of that is in operation in all of the characters' lives. Um, that's crucial to understanding where he is when he begins the play 
and the reasons that he is who he is. It's come from a life of experience. Uh, he's 80 years old, uh, a lot of years as a king, a lot of very complex familial relationships uh, with his daughters and his wives who are no longer present and all of the characters of the play. All of those relationships have to be quite, I mean, they have to be very specific and can only help you if they are specific. And so, yes, one sense of where Lear comes from is really important. And, and some of the major questions about that I have yet to, to solidify because um, I, I, I am uh, really looking forward to this, uh, this in-depth conversation with, with the director about some of my instincts and about his instincts, so where, where uh, and why Lear has done and does do what he does. And so that's a crucial part of what we as actors do, is to come up with, uh, uh, to, f to really flesh out the specifics of a life. And then you figure out as much of that as you can up to the point where the story begins, and, and that helps you launch in with a full, um, a full boat, so to speak. I don't think any of the uncertainty and about this overall journey, I don't think any of that's disappeared. I still have a certain, you know, a positive, very positive respect uh, for the enormity of what I'm uh, in the process of. So none of that's disappeared. I seem to be nibbling away at uh, the edges of that, though, and feeling more comfortable and more secure where I, with where I am now. And that's all, all really good, you know, almost daily work on getting this into the brain and into the, into the body. And uh, all of it's really quite fascinating. And, you know, it's, a, it's actually a thrill. Uh, that's, that's the amazing thing about it. it it's, a, if, it's a gift once you start digging into this text and uh, digging into the story. And as you head into rehearsals, how much of the process so far might go under the heading of the unexpected? Yeah, that describes pretty much the work of, of you know, if not every day, uh, every other day of working on this thing. Okay. Uh, the discoveries that you make embedded in a line that you didn't quite understand or that all of a sudden has a different meaning for you. You know, what's, what's private, what's public, that becomes a really interesting question. When things, when Lear is really addressing the cosmos, when he's addressing himself, when he's addressing, when he is more public, and, and those choices have become really interesting to me um, as he tries to wrestle with the things that are going on in his mind and his human nature, which he makes frequent reference to. Most of the actors who have written about this and written about playing this all of them say that the first scene is the most difficult to understand and that these moments of seeing rage at the very beginning and his huge switch from speaking of Cordelia in the most affectionate of terms to, to leaving her nothing and essentially banishing her from the kingdom uh, is just this like this huge and inex almost inexplicable jump uh, and it is very difficult to understand. And one of my dear friends, John Hutton, who's played this role twice now, he said, if you can figure out that first scene, you're 90% of the way there. And so that's, it, it's incumbent upon me to try to understand how he makes this, these huge leaps and his very specific relationships with his daughters and why he views Cordelia's refusal to acknowledge and to say in public how much she loves him. And that he is, why that uh, essentially blows a fuse in this man's heart and brain. What that shift, huge shift, is all about is, is, a, is a tricky thing. And everybody speaks about it. There is certainly an element of dementia here in the course of this play. He, he, his, his language becomes all entangled and quite sharp in others, um, but he is traveling in the ether at that point. His mind is, 
is is like a mind in the high, in a high fever state. He loses his sense of grounding and anchoring in the world and starts to travel into very, very different kinds of places and then comes back from that journey to meet with his daughter again, uh, to meet with Cordelia and understand um, where he's come from and, and, and a bit about what he's done and a bit about the love that he's never expressed and never really truly appreciated how deep he himself has felt it. It's it's all you know these these huge uh, this huge arc that's happening. Yeah, no question. I mean, I, I it's it's all it's some some of these pieces. It's interesting, you know. Some of these pieces are sort of beginning to to land in in a, in an overall uh, understanding of of where this what drives this character and where he is at different times and you know if i'm lucky more pieces will drop in the next couple of two and a half months before i begin several more well, all several more pieces will drop in the course of rehearsal working with other actors and with a director and if if i'm lucky i'll understand half of them by the time i open you know that are essential we're not the first who with best meaning had incurred the worst. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 no. C come, uh, let's, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I will kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. And so we'll live and pray and sing and Tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and we'll talk with them too. Who wins and who loses, who's in, who's out. And take a punts, if I had my hands free, I'm and take yeah, a punts. Yeah, I'm thinking you're going to have me to be free. Uh, and I would, I would take her down with me somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, oh, let I mean, let we can just, hold them. Let, me, let me just, let me just, uh, yeah, let me just talk to my daughter here for a second. Yeah, and then uh, we're going to go over here. Okay, yeah, and we're going to have a chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Um, and, and, and Hannah, if you kind of treat, yeah, thank you. Um, And then, you know, as my dear friends who have told me uh, about this role, uh, is that you will never get all the pieces at the f in the first crack at it. You will learn a lot about this, and you will get to a certain place in the evolution of your understanding about what drives Lear and how this all works, and, and then you need to do it again. But for right now, <laughs> all I've got is the one on my radar, and I'm... Uh, tremendously excited about the discoveries I'm making and equally equally exciting actually is the very process of discovering the questions uh, a a allowing those to inform this dialogue that I have with the director and and with myself with understanding the really deep things that are in operation here but I think the one thing that I will say is is that the respect for the text is is um, extraordinary right now, and learning and appreciating where Lear goes in these moments, and the um, the sheer beauty of uh, of the language and the process of discovering himself or rediscovering himself is a is a, a great thing to do at the age of sixty four. And how much of you goes into the role of Lear? Oh, it, it's really interesting, you know, the, this process of working on something this large because, um, you know, you wake up in a cold sweat occasionally realizing the mountain that you've got to climb. And then there are some moments like yesterday where I was learning my, uh, going over my lines in the car um, and I, I, I'm feeling like I've, most of it's in the brain. And uh, that's, that's, I, that's, granted, that's only one part of this, this venture, right? That's the easy part. The easy part is learning the lines. 
That's the, what most people who are outside of our business really don't understand. Everybody says that's the classic line for an actor. How did you learn all those lines? Well, that's really the most easy part. That's just like a muscle, and the more you use the muscle, the better you get at it until you get to my age, and then it all goes to hell in a handbasket <laughs> and takes you twice as long to do as, you, as it used to. But really, that's just the beginning. But this process of learning the lines is also at the same time about digging into the thought process of a character, uh, the thought process of King Lear and what journey he's going uh, through. And so I, I feel like I've spent a lot of time inside this journey now. Now, I've worked with, uh, since we spoke, I've worked with the, the director going from beginning to end of the play really taking a look at his ideas about what's happening with Lear and my ideas about what's happening with Lear and trying to figure out where the major question marks are, what's still fuzzy, what's still unclear, what's still up for grabs in rehearsal, what we will try to discover. And that's really interesting to me. So I have some major question marks that I don't understand yet. And that I hope will I will learn once we start uh, the uh, rehearsal process in just two and a half short weeks from now. You know, I forget when 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 did we first talk, you and I? Yeah. So I've been with this thing for like nine months now, which has been great uh, and a wonderful way to to learn this. It's a luxury that a lot of actors simply don't have um, that I've had to 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 live inside this text for that long. And I hope, <laughs> I hope that it will st stand me in really good stead as I go into rehearsal. Not only because of the lines and all of that, the text will be in my head, but I'm beginning to be able to breathe the character a little bit. And uh, that's, that's, that's a good place to be. Yeah, yeah you, have to have, you have to have the whole thing in your, in your head and in order to be able to track what's happening to you, right? So... So that's, that's been an interesting process and, and um, you know, and it's, it's I, I'm, I'm a, good, uh, a good distance down that road now. And that's, that's, really, that's really good at this time. I feel like I, I, in, in, on December 27 when we start that I might actually be prepared in the way that I wanted to be. We try that again. But the same, the same entry. Same entry. Yeah. We're not the first. Who with best meaning have incurred the worst? Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters? No, 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 no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. And so we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and we'll talk with them too <clears throat> who wins who loses who's in who's out and take upon us the mystery of things as if we were god spies and we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sets of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. And what might you like to share with your students about this role and acting in general? One of the principles that I try to relay to my students, which is the concept of the invention of language in the moment. And I don't know if we've talked about that before, but everything of what we say, unless it's a memorized speech or something that's read from a text, is invented. In this case, it just happens to be invented in the most beautiful language ever written. And so, which makes it doubly extraordinary. Um, it's all an iambic pentameter. The choice of words that, uh, that Shakespeare has uh, has produced, which is extraordinary. His vocabulary is, uh, and his way of expressing this is beyond beautiful. I mean, in, in most cases it's, and so the, the idea that you're inventing words in the moment and they just happen to be in iambic pentameter and the most gorgeously expressed thoughts that most anyone has ever written 
in the English language is, is something to behold. And so and I try to encourage my students to understand is that that's what makes it alive. That's what makes it active because you are actually trying to go through a thought and trying to communicate what that thought is and trying to find the words to communicate what that thought is. It just happens to be this extraordinary language that, that is the basis of all of that. And so that would be one thing I keep on reminding them. You don't know what you're going to say in the next sentence before you get there. And so don't get ahead of yourself. Try to figure out what it is and where those words are coming from. You and I are doing an exercise with this right now. You know, that, that's what makes it active. And that's what makes it come alive, you know. And uh, so that's one of the things. And, and the other thing that I suppose I would say to my students is welcome to my life. You asked me how nervous was I? Um, this is a little bit of whatever you're going to get used to. And this nervousness or anxiety is going to become a friend. And you'll either put that friend in the closet for enough time to, to do what you know how to do. Or that friend will wake up and, and say hi, you know. By the way, we'll have, I think it's, there are six Dartmouth students who are coming over on the experience term during the time we'll be doing Lear, and I know at least four of them are in the show with me, uh, one of whom is going to play my daughter, Cordelia. And so I will be working with my students. And so now there, our relationship at, uh, when I'm in, perform in rehearsal and performance will be quite different, will be professional to, you know, professional or professional to, to apprentice or whatever that relationship is, which is different. Um, but I'm hoping that that experience will be interesting for them to see um, somebody, a uh, professional actor who happens to be their professor, uh, uh, go through this process and, and fall and get up and fall again and get up and see what that process is like for them so that they understand how vulnerable and how tricky a process this is. It'll be really interesting. It'll be really interesting. And you know, we have, the director will be doing most of the talking to them. I won't be coaching them. I'll be coaching myself and that'll be plenty. I'll have plenty on my plate. But uh, I'm hoping that they can learn by uh, just observing and asking me questions when, when possible. I hope that they will see in practice, a lot of the things that we've been talking about in theory and the things that I've been coaching them on, and I have several of my students are going to be with me in uh, King Lear. So that'll be an interesting, uh, interesting time. Can we try that all again from the answer? Yeah, because A, it feels, um, this moment does not feel terribly public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I guess, um, so I don't know what the arrangement is here. I mean, when she, when she is saying, you know, uh, shall we not see these daughters and these sisters, um, what, is, what are we getting at here? Is this, um, is, is she speaking to me, to Edmund? Um, uh, what, 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 I mean, what, in other words, what authority do I have anyway? If, if she says, shall we not see these sis daughters and these sisters, uh, and I said, sure, that's a good idea. What would the outcome of that scene be? I don't think you do this in the Right. So I think actually the show We See These Daughters, I, thank you, because I think Stella, the show We Not See These Daughters and These Sisters, may actually be to the soldiers or Edmund, okay. not to your dad. And then it's your dad who you were to say, no, no, we no, shouldn't I, want to see that. Yeah, let's not do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I mean, she she is on on our gig. She is the she is the ultimate authority. Yes, in our army. Correct. Right. Which is decimated. Now. I know, but still, it is. I mean, so I I, I guess what I'm getting at the conversation is 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 more between the two two of them. And that I, I'm the one who says, no, let's not do the whole uh, uh, abasing ourselves at the feet of the sisters. Fuck this that. is all very helpful. This is great. Because then if you're, uh, who has, Jamie, is that Max? Um, uh, if you've even been gotten more here by that point, and she's more talking to the guards and to Edmund, that no, 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 no. no, no, no. That, that, and then no, you can even assure Max in that point, yeah. like, uh, don't worry, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually going to get I, her to prison. Uh, yeah. And that could no. give him cause to release you, and you could then go to her.
doesn't it at some point simply come down to the fact that there is Lear, there's you playing Lear, and then there is you. Yeah, and, th and the intersection of those three is what makes for the richest performance. Another one of the things that we talk about as actors is the personalization of, of a role. Yes, you are trying to put yourself in the skin of someone else, bringing along, however, all of the things that make you who you are and the things that you feel as though you can bring. Uta Hagen, one of the great teachers, says that you are everything that you will ever need, that you dig deep inside, an, inside yourself, deep enough inside yourself, and you can pull out these various pieces. And as a friend of mine once said, you are this enormous puzzle you, you are in this particular shape with these pieces fitting together. And what you do as an actor is you go in there and you pull the puzzle apart and you pick one piece from over here and one piece from over here and one piece from over and you start to put the puzzle back together again in a different shape. And so you highlight certain parts of yourself and understand certain parts. And that is the process of personalization. That's when you watch somebody and you feel as though they are actually living it. That's the result of that work of truly bringing yourself to it. And then you start to pull out the things about Lear that are like Jamie and I will never have a kingdom. I will never have any of the things or, and I hope to God I never have the tragedy of King Lear's life. But to, to be able to understand that tragedy, that whole long arc that he goes through, through the storm, the elements into this understanding of himself just at the end of his life, which is the tragedy of it, finding love and all of those things are very universal. They're just in different proportions in me than they are in Lear. And so what I'm trying to do, as I said, is to turn up the dial hot enough that I can understand where Lear is coming from based on things that are in my ken, that are in my ex life experience. And hopefully the twain meet somewhere between King Lear and the actor and that that comes alive in a meaningful and honest uh, way. And so, you know, one of the, one of the core, and I, I think we spoke about this, one of the great challenges of this, this journey is the very first scene where he rejects his youngest daughter, Cordelia, for not having, uh, for not being able to tell him in public how much she loves him in the same way that his other two daughters do. And, and he snaps and reacts in ways that are you just cannot believe you're seeing in front of your eyes. And to make sense of that move is the critical piece of figuring out how this journey begins. Once the journey moves on, it becomes much more clear. And, and, and the other actors that I've spoken to in the past about this have echoed this sentiment. They've, they've all talked about how difficult this very first scene is. And so I look forward to that. That's a great challenge. I think we've talked, you and I, about how often the word nature appears in this. And, it, and there, there are all sorts of meanings of that word. The garden which we need to tend, that, that is certainly, nature is a very big part of Lear's journey in this. That is the physical nature that we, in which we live. And then his, his own human nature, which is equally complex, perhaps more so actually. And his ability to, by the end of the play, have squared his own human nature in the larger nature, the natural world, I, I think is part of that, that arc. It does bring to mind sort of a, a question about how we tend our gardens. If, if you look at how you tend the garden of your own soul or how you tend the garden of your own heart and how you feed it and weed it, what, are, what is that process? What is it like? And the, the, the whole process of nature in this play is extremely important. And so I've been fascinated by that as well. Yeah, I think, I think 
the thing that the thing that is um, probably resonating very strongly with me at this point is that I hope I will be able to do a combination of two things to bring all of the study of the last nine months or so into the rehearsal room as I begin this rehearsal process. And the other thing that I hope I will have the courage and ability and flexibility of brain to do is to remain open enough to everything that's going to be joining this uh, journey and all of the people that are going to be joining this journey and all of the input that's going to be joining this journey. And if, if that, that, that requires a vulnerability and the recognition that you don't have all the answers, I join a community. As soon as you put another actor and start in front of you and start talking to that actor, your whole world changes. It's, it's a different experience. It's not a tape recorder. Yeah. It's not a tape recorder. It's a whole life that's developing in front of you and you have to have the courage to take that, receive it, and then send. And that's part, that's part of what makes this magic between two people. How are you feeling about where you are at the moment on this incredible journey? Yeah, it's been extraordinary so far. I mean, I always knew it would be, and it always seemed like it was nine months off and six months off, and now all of a sudden it's right here. And uh, it's really exciting to be in a room uh, with all of these really talented folks. And I've been working on this, you know, solo, uh, essentially for nine months with, with input from a dramaturg and from the director. But now I'm actually talking to people and I'm interacting with other actors and interacting on a sustained basis, you know, eight hours a day with this character and with this play. And so the playing field has completely changed now. Uh, what I'm finding, I think, is that all of the preparation has been good. And I feel on top, relatively speaking, on top of this substantial text so that I'm relatively open and hope to stay that way throughout this three weeks of rehearsal and then, of course, into the three weeks of performance uh, where I'll be doing a huge chunk of my learning in, in front of an audience. But the first week has been really rewarding. I feel like I, I get up, I start vocalizing, I am running lines in the car to and from the rehearsal, I am eating, sleeping, Lear now. Uh, breathing Lear. I mean, it feels like it's a mad dash to the finish. There's, it's, it's a massive amount to do in three short weeks, but I feel like I'm in really good hands, and I'd, I'd say I'm feeling quite, quite good about things right, right now. And uh, I know that there's a lot, lot of, a little more to come down this road. You know, I've seen the, with the costumes and had the first, co you know, had the first costume fittings and sort of beginning to see what that's like, beginning to think about what we want to do in terms of the age makeup and all of those other choices and experimenting with where the voice is sitting and and the level of madness that we are wanting to achieve and what that's about specifically. All of those questions, they're, they're running through my brain for most of my day now. And I would imagine in a good part of my sleeping state. My favorite rehearsals as an actor are uh, uh, those rehearsals which are runs of the play in front of an audience. The preview period was always the most exciting part of the rehearsal. Uh, working, you got to work for five hours a day, go put that, that modified uh, show up in front of an audience and then work on it for five more hours and fine tune and, and it's, it's in front of an audience that you really find out what part of the story is being effectively told and your relationship to the audience is, uh, in, is incredibly informative about what's working, what's not, all of that stuff. It's, it's a very, very exciting time in, that, in the process. Uh, tender Lords of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Know that we've divided in three our kingdom, and tis 
our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths while we, unburdened, crawl toward death. Jamie Horton and King Lear was produced by Norden Productions. <laughs>